Hey YouTubers, it's Carmine, and holy crap, the new trailer for Season 6 just hit. If you haven't seen it yet, then I highly recommend you go check it out because it is insane. HBO really cut it close this year because normally we would get it like two months before the season premiere. Now before we begin, I want to give a big thanks to everybody who messaged me to let me know it came out. Usually it is you guys who keep me up to date on anything and everything in the entertainment world, so thank you. Now usually when the first trailer hits, the GOT season begins, and to celebrate, I partnered up with Home Leisure Direct to get you guys another giveaway, and this time it's a one-of-a-kind piece of artwork signed by Sean Bean himself. That's right, the Beanmeister. It's incredibly rare and valued at around $500. For a chance to win this, head on over to my Facebook page for entry details. I'll leave a link in the description below. Now let's get on to the breakdown. First, let's start with Jon Snow. The trailer picks up right as last season left off with the aftermath of the infamous for the watch scene. They're leaving him out there to bleed out and freeze before they come back for his body, and as we learn later on in the trailer, they will be coming back for his body. The one thing I'm really curious about is what happened to Ed? He went with Jon Snow to Hardhome, and if you remember back to that episode, John brought with him some members of the Night's Watch, and some of them survived. So what happened to those guys? Why didn't they tell everybody what they saw? I hope they answer these questions within the first couple of episodes, because it's really been bothering me since last season. Jamie returning to King's Landing with Marcella's body. I wonder if Tristane is still on board. Personally, if it was me, I would have thrown him overboard. Even though we know he had nothing to do with it, Jamie doesn't. I wonder if episode 1 will pick up right as Jamie is confronting Tristane about this. Here we have Jamie trying to calm Cersei down a little by telling her that they're going to take everything back and more. In my season 6 first look, I mentioned how I was excited to get the old Jamie back. While he has one of the most awesome character arcs in the whole show, I still miss season 1 Jamie when he was kind of a douche. Davos is probably still depressed over losing Stannis. My assumption here is that Davos will most likely not believe that Stannis died, like many of you, and I'm going to go ahead and assume that Davos will be the one to learn of his defeat from the Pink Letter, which I still believe will be written and delivered. It's probably one of the reasons the Night's Watch wants Jon's body so badly. It wouldn't be out of character for Ramsay to threaten to kill all of them if they don't show that Jon is dead. Why would Ramsay threaten them? Because Sansa escaped. This is my thinking. Theon and Sansa escape Winterfell, and as long as she's gone, the Boltons hold almost no legitimacy in the North. They need her back as soon as possible, and Ramsay probably believes the only place she could run to for safe haven is Castle Black, because if you remember last season, Ramsay told her that Jon Snow became Lord Commander. In the books, they stab Jon because he decides to break one of his oaths to the Night's Watch. In the show, however, it could be possible that Ramsay sent a letter to Castle Black to be delivered to anybody who wasn't the Lord Commander and demanded his death. There are only 50 people stationed there and as we've learned, Ramsay needs only 20 good men to fuck shit up. Now this is something I reported on a while ago. In the upcoming big battle for this season, Ramsay will be burning someone on the cross before the battle, possibly to demoralize the enemy. Now the question is, is he fighting the Wildlings or maybe some of the Loyalist Northern Houses who hate the Boltons? As we learned from last season, many of the Northern Lords still hold loyalty to the Starks. We see this in Season 5, Episode 2, when Stannis receives his reply from Lyanna Mormont. In this one, we get Melisandre saying it was a lie. Once again, it didn't seem like a lie. This is another extreme contrast to the book if it turns out she's telling the truth about it all being a lie. They sent Thoros of Mir to convert Robert Baratheon into a believer, but he became too caught up in his whoring and drinking. I can see the plot of this turning out that Melisandre was sent to Stannis because, out of all the other kings, Stannis was known to be someone who wasn't a true believer in the Faith of the Seven. So it could have all been a lie or her just trying to get a pity party from Davos. Jorah and Dario on their adventures in Essos to look for Danny, and they do eventually find her ring. I have a theory about Dario though, being the leader of the Harpies, or at least allied with them. Follow me on this. Something about him seems off to me, and I don't expect him to stick around for too long. Maybe it's me being a bit too paranoid, but something tells me that Dario planned to get rid of both Jorah and Barristan as her protectors since he'd have the most trouble against them, who are seasoned fighters. Jorah was exiled, which worked out in Dario's favor. On the day that Barristan died, Dario told Danny that he'd protect her and to let Barristan go off and patrol the streets. Coincidentally, the same day that the Harpies decided to attack. Even though Danny has her unsullied and some Dothraki still guarding her, as we've seen, Dario doesn't find them too much of a threat considering he knows all too well their fighting styles and techniques. Like I said, he'd have more trouble against two seasoned knights. I'll expand on this theory of mine in another video. Here we have Danny with the Dothraki under the rule of a new cow. Apparently she'll remain as a slave amongst them, but it doesn't look like they've harmed her too much. This appears to be the full size of their slaves. 
While Danny outlawed it in Slaver's Bay, the Dothraki do not hold to one location for too long and never really seem to follow any laws. It also looked like she's at Vas Dothrak, or maybe another location in the Dothraki Sea, because it looks like they're in a canyon, and from the looks of it, it seems a lot different from the Vas Dothrak in Season 1. The High Sparrow returns, and it appears he is talking to the Zombie Mountain. I love Jonathan Fry's performance last year, and I do hope he sticks around until at least the end of the season. We finally come back to the Greyjoy plotline. In case you forgot, they're still rebelling against the Iron Throne, but because they have insignificant numbers and several casualties, they've been brushed off a bit by the small council and even the showrunners. I know you guys are tired of hearing it, but they still could have introduced their plotline last season. How? Remove the romance plot of Sam and Gilly and Masande and Grey Worm? Boom. That's like an extra hour of content right there. When we last saw Sansa in my previous First Look video, she and Theon were outside in the cold, and it looked like she had a baby bump. Here it looks like she's found her way to someplace nice, I hope. Once again, I really hope the writers stop using her as a punching bag for every psychopath out there. I mean, the only way her situation could get any worse is if she stumbles into Bill Cosby's house. Here it looks like Tyrion is going down to see the other dragons. As I've said before, I'm going to go ahead and assume that at some point, the other remaining slave cities will try to invade Marine while Danny is away. Tyrion is the only one with experience in a siege, so he may be there to try and release the dragons to help them in fending off whoever is attacking them. I love how in the previous scene before this one, Lance was like, Order your men to stand down or there will be violence. Um, you do realize he has armor, a sword, and he's the size of a... mountain? He can fuck you up. Unless you have a vengeful Dornish prince behind you with a helmet on, I suggest you back the fuck up. But then Cersei's like, I choose violence. Oh shit, son! I haven't been this excited for a showdown since Eminem battled that black guy in 8 Mile. As I said before, it's possible that Davos and some of the men he took with him moved Jon Snow's body to his room in Castle Black, but the men who betrayed Jon want his body. Once again, I feel as though they betrayed him because he was helping the Wildlings and because Ramsay wanted him dead. They need his body to show that he's actually dead. They need that proof, otherwise they all die. But keep in mind, that's my speculation on what I think is happening. That's not like official or anything. Here we have what I've been waiting for since Season 1, the Battle at the Tower of Joy. After Robert's rebellion was over, Ned Stark took a couple of guys with him to go retrieve his sister. Three Kingsguard were protecting her while he, she was in the tower. The guy in the front looks like Ned, but his face may be shadowed out, because reasons. In this scene, it does look like Ned's group is fighting against the Kingsguard. For those of you who are wondering why their armor looks so different, it is because the previous Kingsguard had the traditional Targaryen emblem and dragon design all over their armor because they served Danny's father, Aerys Targaryen II, most commonly known as the Mad King. Jorah wore something similar on his armor. Tyrion noticed it in Episode 4, Season 5. Here we have Cersei and the Zombie Mountain. I'm going to go ahead and assume that wherever she goes, he goes. It is also possible that they are reporting for her trial. In the other scene, we saw Tommen, and it's also possible that he's excusing himself from the trial like he did with Tyrion. I can't tell whose ships those are, but it's possible that it is Euron Greyjoy arriving on the Iron Islands. My favorite character, Peter Baelish, returns to the north, and it's possible that he rescues Sansa. When we last saw him, he had a meeting with Cersei that went very well for him. It's safe to say that Peter will continue to use Sansa for his control of the north. Peter has an amazing talent of turning every situation in his favor. He used Sansa as a way to forge an alliance with the Boltons, only to betray them by ratting them out to Cersei. Then he waits on Stannis and his army to attack Winterfell so he can easily pick off the winner, who should have lost men afterwards. What Peter didn't count on is Stannis' men abandoning him after he burned his own daughter. So because of this, the Boltons didn't lose as many men as he had hoped for an easy fight against them. I'm really excited to see what he has up his sleeve this time for the new season. It looks like Marjorie is still imprisoned by the Faith, and here we have the Bolton army getting ready to fire arrows on someone. You can tell it's the Boltons because of the banners flying in the back, and because of their usual Hershey Kiss looking helmets. Over here, it looks like Theon has been found out by Ramsay's hunters. It's possible that the person Ramsay burns is Theon, and I wouldn't be too surprised if it happens. But by judging what we saw earlier, it looks like Sansa got away. But it's also possible that Brienne catches up with them and saves them since we see her killing some Bolton soldiers. In this scene, we get a look at Euron being baptized, and later on, we also see him on a stormy bridge. And it looks like Melisandre's leeches continue to work after all. Continuing on with the Greyjoys, it looks like the show has made Theon's sister Yara a lesbian, or at least a bisexual. Arya doing some parkour. The Bolton army doing some nice formation against what appears to be a bunch of wildlings, and maybe Stark loyalist Northmen. Arya, again, still blind, or maybe she's testing out her own powers. Nobody said there could only be one warg in the family. 
And here we have Marjorie confessing to the High Sparrow, followed by the Tyrell army, led by Jaime Lannister, going to take her back. I really do hope Mace loses his shit and stops being such a pushover. And finally, we get to the last two scenes that really made my day. Bran is back. Yay. Hopefully this year, he won't be as boring as before. I don't know about you guys, but I'm not a big fan of Bran, and I really do hope his visions are worth it. It appears that the Three-Eyed Raven is teaching him to see the past and who the real enemy is, because he turns around, and there's the Night's King. And last, we have Davos about to kick some ass. There is Ghost, and I can't tell if they managed to kill him too, but he's there with Jon. Davos picks up Jon's Longclaw and is prepared to fight the traitors at Castle Black. At least they could be, or maybe Jon's friends protecting him? Either way, we've never seen Davos actually fight anybody, so I'm really excited to see this. So, I absolutely love this trailer. It still doesn't top Season 4's Cities Lie in Dust, but it's still pretty good. It hit all the right places and showed us just enough. In case you were wondering why I didn't go over every single picture, it's mainly because some of them were self-explanatory or really had nothing going on at all. But yeah, thanks for watching. Leave your thoughts below and let me know what did you think about the trailer. Also, if you're new to my channel, check out my previous Game of Thrones history videos and be sure to check out Phil Nye the Issues Guy's reaction to the trailer. He's one of the few reviewers I actually enjoy. Once again, I want to thank you guys for watching. Have a good one.